can't believe they bring her in when she's not even out there. And of course, instead of Victor right in the front row. I mean, they gotta do something. They have to. There's all this room in the back. Put them right in the front row where I can't shoot. You're wearing sunglasses on the top of your head. They make you take them off. Oh, ridiculous. Was the family here last time you were here, or, or, or whatever, the victim? Yeah, there, I mean, see, the thing is, it was something like this. There's 80 counts, there's like yeah. probably 100 victims with all the family members yeah. that are all considered victims. But Marcy's Law doesn't say what they say that it says. State of Wisconsin versus, actually, let me redo do that. I have to start my live stream. Sorry about that.
right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Fort Wolf Hall State of Wisconsin versus Daryl Brooks, case number 21CF1848. We have the appearances, please. Good afternoon, Judge Sue Upper, Leslie Baby, and Zach Wichow, all appearing for the state of Wisconsin. Good afternoon, uh, Daryl Brooks over here is in person in custody with his attorneys, Anna Keyes and Jeremy Perry. We are here today to address the defense motion to change venue. Before I do that, I will ask the state if the state is complied with victim rights. Yes, I have, Your Honor. Uh, several victims are present in court today. I think some may be watching by video means, but we are in full compliance. It's not great. Does, do any of the victims wish to make a statement today on the uh, request to change venue? None of them have informed me Thank you. And that, of course, was uh, Jen Dunn with Victim Witness. Any preliminary issues uh, we need to take up before moving to the merits of the motion from the state? No, you are? From the defense? No. All right. I know I had the parties file simultaneous briefs. Um, I certainly reviewed those. I reviewed uh, the original motion as well, but because of the simultaneous filing of the briefs, briefs I will allow the parties to make uh, brief arguments here today if they wish. It is the defense motion. The defense bears the burden of proof. Uh, so I'll turn to you. Thank you, Judge. Um, there are a few kind of preliminary matters. One, I just, you know, we've been colloquially uh, calling this a change of venue motion, um, but we did ask in the alternative, and I think we make that clear in, well, in the original motion and then also the supplement that, uh, the relief that we're seeking is either a change of venue or the impaneling of a jury from another county. Um, and I just want to be sure that everyone is is, is clear on that. The state's um, response uh, addressing Parsons' law seemed to only touch on um, if the venue were to be changed. Uh, the other thing is, and I talked with um, DA Opper prior to this hearing, and I think I can state that uh, we aren't disputing sort of each other's numbers on this, that there isn't a dispute as to uh, the content of the uh, articles, the many articles that we attached to the different filings in this case, and sort of the numbers breakdown, kind of the analysis that we each did based on the questions that we discussed in our respective filings. Um, that there isn't like, a, there's a dispute about, you know, like for instance, we said uh, that the questionnaires, our analysis showed that 720 either attended or knew someone who attended. And it's my understanding that there's no um, dispute about that calculation. There is a dispute about the meaning of that calculation, but not those individual calculations as they are. Um, and I want to be clear about that because while all the questionnaires are in the court record uh, in terms of sort of showing our work or, or things like that, I want to be, be sure that the record is, is clear um, and that it sounds like you know, there's no objection to kind of on both sides those numbers that have been provided. Um, I can confirm that with the state first if you would like before you continue. Sure, that's fine. Attorney Upper. Agreed, Your Honor. Um, one question, though, on that, does that include the Google Trend analysis graph that was provided then? Uh, it, it does. I, I think I actually looked at that uh, at the time of filing of the original motion, and, and I'll address that in my argument right now. All right, go ahead. Um, so a few things. The... I, I, I don't want to bounce around too much between the state's response or the state's argument and, and our argument, just our substantive argument, but, but I probably have to a little bit. Um, the response, I think, is addressing maybe the wrong question at this stage in terms of uh, actual, um, like, on sort of unable, unable to be rehabilitated type of bias that might be indicated by the questions. Um, and I think that the change of venue motion, or, you know, I'll just use that generically, um, 
really is asking a broader question at this stage. And I'm going to point the court to uh, some language in, in Thomas v. State, which is at 53 with second 483. That's a 1972 Wisconsin Supreme Court opinion. And I have just a couple of, of very short lines from that. And I'm, I'm looking at pages 490 to 91. Um, and this is, you know, most of these, actually, I think all of these uh, opinions addressing change of venue are on direct appeal after a conviction has already occurred. And so a jury necessarily was seated in all of those cases. And what the court in Thomas says is the fact that a jury was drawn is not conclusive of the question whether the change of venue should have been granted. In theory and also in practice, a jury represents the community in which its members live. A juror's decision is subject to the judgment of his friends and neighbors and what they think is important in determining whether a fair trial can be had. And then it goes on and it says, a motion for change of venue or continuance shall be granted whenever it is determined that because of the dissemination of potentially prejudicial material, there's a reasonable likelihood that in the absence of such relief, a fair trial cannot be had. A showing of actual prejudice should, shall not be required. And the standard then is a reasonable probability of prejudice inherent in the situation. And so kind of with that guidepost, what we tried to do in, in, and tried to point out in the original motion to change venue is that in this case, in this community, the potentially prejudicial material and the effects in the community due to the unique circumstances of the actual incident here. This is a little different than a lot of the change of venue cases that are discussed where it is only analyzing publicity. And we've pointed out there were six deaths and dozens of many dozens injured from many different groups and associations, thousands of direct witnesses, vast financial support that the community got together, vast outpouring of support, there's a slogan used to demonstrate community solidarity because of this incident. The, the whole blue light bulbs distribution and displays. Extensive coverage of Mr. Brooks, his prior record, his pending charges, his custody status, photos of him that accompanied many of the articles of him in red and in shackles. The different Facebook groups the extensive coverage of the actual incident, videos being played, the extensive coverage and highlighting of his court appearances. We noted in the motion that we filed that this is, I, I believe still, it, it was as of yesterday, still highlighted in red in terms of information regarding Darrell E. Brooks on the court's website. And then frequent reminders of this incident throughout the community. There have been efforts to name a baseball park. There are portraits of the victims hanging in City Hall. The local government decided to spend over $800,000 on barriers to make people feel safe at public events. A long list that gets longer regularly of fundraisers throughout the business community to support victims in this case, prayer vigils held, a temporary memorial and then the efforts to create a permanent memorial and the distribution of money to a long list of victims, including those that weren't physically injured but were affected by responding. And so I think when we were drafting these questionnaires, if I remember correctly, and at least in, in my mind, these questionnaires were to serve a dual purpose, potentially dual purpose. One, it was a survey to see just how extensive those personal connections in the community were in the potential jury pool and whether it's true that the community has been so affected. And then the secondary purpose would be that if the answer to that first question was not so much that venue needs to be changed, it would serve as a very good starting off point in terms of individual voir dire and working towards impaneling a jury in this case. Um, so the analysis and, and 
our analysis, uh, you know, we've looked at the questionnaires as they've continued to filter in, um, but the numbers I provided were after we had received, I think, 1,557 of them. And we had a relatively short amount of time to process a lot of information. Both, both sides had a relatively short amount of time. And so we looked at, to answer that general question about the community in which its members live and the judgment of the jurors' friends and neighbors and what they think and just the pervasiveness of this incident and the effects and how widespread they are throughout the community, we looked at, I think we came up with nine initial filters. The first filter was those within one degree of separation from the parade, which means you were either at it or you know somebody who was at it. And the reason we did that is because everyone's experience at the parade, everyone's experience was traumatizing. And if you know someone at the parade, you not only know someone who is a witness, now they might not be a witness listed by the state or going to be called at trial, but you know somebody who is a witness. You also personally know somebody who experienced a traumatizing event. And when people know someone who was there, information received from other sources is filtered through what you already know from the person that you know. And that's just the way life works. And I think going back to that general question, not a sort of voir dire analysis, um, that we have to look at those, those numbers and that that in combination with the prejudicial media coverage and the reminders of this event that, there's, that those community members are faced with every day in the community. And that's you know, like I'm referencing sort of the portraits at City Hall and the different memorials and the signs as people go through the community that say Waukesha Strong and the fundraisers and the neighbors and friends of neighbors that are affected. Um, it has to be filtered through that. The second filter that we did was that those who attended a prayer vigil in support. The third was that those who donated money or attended a fundraiser, that's you know, a showing of actual support to the victims of this incident. You know, so moved by what happened that people opened their pocketbooks. Um, whether you and we, we discussed this at the time of coming up with the questionnaire, but you know, if you um, donated or attended a fundraiser, I think really showing the same level of solidarity and support. Um, we included those who were members of a social media group in support of the victims. Uh, I think the most notable of these is the Waukesha Strong Community Facebook group. And the postings are regular solidarity with victims, fundraisers, commentary on the proceedings. The fifth filter that we did was people who said, you know, because we had, I think, listed out these different ones, right? The display of blue lights, uh, display in some way of the broken heart symbol, um, the, the jerseys event, and then other solidarity with the victims. And so we, we included that filter as well of, you know, who of this jury, potential jury members displayed some display of solidarity with the parade victims. And then we included in the questionnaire, I think it was questions 97, A through H, and it listed out um, a number of, you know, potentially sort of traumatic personal effects from this, uh, including, you know, and in, in looking at that of like, who of this these potential jurors in this community through that same lens, faced with the daily reminders of their neighbors and what they're through and what they see every day and the news that they are subjected to, um, how many of them selected yes to one or more of those of being, you know, having an actual adverse effect on this individual? And it can't be looked at in a vacuum. It can't just be, you know, this person, um, you know, read about it and grew uncomfortable with, with something. 
it's that person also is is in this community and has all those daily reminders and all of the other things in terms of how that news is filtered through that person. If I'm in a different county, I might have thought about this on you know a day of or the week of or a month after, but I'm not confronted with those daily reminders of in yards, in storefronts, on clothing, and then also just seeing the you know the memorials. Um, the seventh filter we did was if you were personally familiar with someone injured or affected by the parade. The eighth was if you viewed court proceedings in this case, and there's some overlap. I think the state included in its analysis um, that if you knew something of Mr. Brooks's prior record or other charges, but if you have, if you viewed the proceedings in this case, if you viewed the initial appearance and the initial bail decision, you would necessarily know a lot about the past allegations and pending ones. Um, the ninth, we included a few of kids in the Waukesha School District, and that's because of there were so many kids were victims in this case. The schools closed down. People had to scramble for coverage, undoubtedly. Uh, decent chance that these people's children know people who were victimized. Um, and then, you know, we also looked at the familiarity with the coverage and we had, you know, in the, the questionnaire revealed if you were, you know, very closely, closely, moderately, and so on. And again, I think that that, you know, is through the lens of not just I'm curious about this, but I'm surrounded by it with all of those reminders and kind of that community effect. Um, I want to address a few things about the state's filing on this. Um, they referred to, I don't know if it's pronounced the Fonte case, Font in the beginning, um, I think largely to, to cite to it for the list of sort of uh, media factors and how to analyze that. But, but that case itself um, had one victim versus the many dozens in this case. Um, I, I think just factually is very, very distinguishable from this case in terms of the sheer number of victims, the sheer number of witnesses from diverse groups, uh, the multiple ways this community has been affected. Um, and then they went through just the state, I think then proceeded to go through um, the eight listed factors to how to analyze a change of venue motion. And again, those are largely geared towards, actually they're entirely geared towards how to analyze uh, prejudicial publicity. And so I think it's not a perfect fit with this. The first one is the inflammatory nature of the publicity. Um, I think the state argued that it's it was, it's not been intended to inflame or arouse community feelings against, no attempt to influence public opinion. And I would, I would point to the effect of the coverage. Um, in the supplement that we filed, I included the investigatory article that had been up on uh, JS Online for, for months about how the criminal justice system failed to hold Mr. Brooks accountable. And it, it goes line by line analyzing prior record and prior accusations and pending accusations. Um, the timing and specificity, that's the Google trend that was included. Um, I, honestly, I think that uh, people don't need to Google it, you know, after the initial, the initial weeks of this, they're confronted with it everywhere. You know, it, I think um, it's very logical that you would see a spike in people searching by Google something that is uh, in that dropping off when the news is is everywhere and the reminders of it are everywhere in constant. Um, so I, I think it's limited value to include, um, I think that, and I think that analysis was for the state of Wisconsin, if I remember right, and not the Waukesha community. Uh, the degree of care selecting a jury, um, the state wrote everyone everywhere will know about this and this is 
kind of sounding like a uh, common refrain with me, but that's that's not the problem. The problem is that those here know their neighbors, know their kids' friends, the reminders in storefronts, front porches, yards, city hall, the barricades at the public events. It's, it's more than just um, a high profile case where a lot of people know about it. It's those other things that it has to be looked at in context. Um, familiarity with publicity, and, you know, again, I go back to the Thomas V. State language of a jury represents the community in which its members live. A juror's decision is subject to the judgment of his friends and neighbors and what they think is important in determining whether a fair trial can be had. Um, it then goes on to touch on use of peremptory challenges. We're not, we're not there yet. Uh, the state's participation in the adverse publicity um, I've not really ever suggested that the state has taken much of a participation in that. The severity of the offense charged, um, it can't get more serious than this. And verdict return, and again, that's included because all of these cases are discussed post-conviction on appeal. Um, just a few more points to make. The There's a discussion about federal cases, they talk about the Enron case. The Enron decision focused on the area's size and diversity. Uh, you know, it's there was no social media at the time. The jury in that case was pulled from Houston, which is the fourth largest city in America. Um, it's, uh, it's, you know, those are, that was an important factor in that decision and it's an important thing to distinguish in this case in terms of just sheer numbers. Also, um, while it was highly publicized, it's also a fairly obscure financial crime in terms of the uh, people really knowing about it. The Boston bomber case, again, that pulled a jury from nine counties, which is, I believe, 5.2 million people and was 75% of Massachusetts overall population. It had an international spread of, of victims. This case, we're looking at one county, and it's it's a large county, but not even 10% of Wisconsin's population. Um, I think the population of Waukesha County is somewhere around 400,000 people. Um, I would ask for the defense motion to be granted when, I, you know, I, I think that this return of, I'm not sure what the number is up to now. You know, we, we had the count at 1557 in terms of questionnaires returned. I think it bears out what we alleged in the initial motion. I think it shows that this is widespread, that, you know, if you weren't there, you, you know, there's a good chance you know somebody who was there. And if you don't answer those two things, um, a lot of these other categories, this was, uh, this affected a significant majority of this county. And I think under those circumstances, uh, and and considering the constitutional amendment to the, to the victim rights, um, you know, we've from day one uh, suggested the alternative as well as is fine, which is um, as a solution to this, to, to be sure to protect Mr. Brooks's constitutional rights and this court's interest in having a fair jury, which is a fair jury trial, which is um, to impanel a jury from another county. Thanks. Thank you. Attorney Appa? Oh, thank you, Judge. Uh, Judge, let me just uh, begin by saying, as Attorney Perry did, Technically, we're not disagreeing with the math or the filtering that the defense did in this case. Our objection is with the conclusions that they draw, just as he said. Um, we do not agree with, we don't agree with the premise that they have one degree of separation by saying, I knew somebody who was at the parade. By its very nature, that's a vague sentence, right? If I tell the court, my sister's, uh, excuse me, my assistant's cousin's in-law 
was at the parade. Do I know that person? Yes. Is that going to have great potential impact on me as a juror? Probably not. That's exactly the kind of question we need to have that person here to explain it to us. Do I know somebody? What does that even mean? The question is very broad. It had to be, I understand that. Can you conclude by a sentence, I knew somebody was at the parade, there's one degree of separation? Absolutely not. So we reject the conclusions that were drawn by the defense to come down to these numbers. We don't accept that knowing somebody who was at the parade is an automatic disqualification. We, we would disagree with that conclusion. Obviously, these are questions the court will have to uh, decide for this motion. But essentially, as I read the brief and I hear Attorney Perry talk, they immediately disqualified half of the pool based on their statement that I know somebody who was at the parade. You have to drill down into these questions. A lot of the questions did, and a lot of the questions said just because you knew somebody was at the parade, can you be fair? That's the key question, right? Can they be fair? Um, we don't think uh, that having a child in the Waukesha School District means objectively that you cannot be fair. We don't think the fact that you saw a social media post means that you cannot be fair. We do not think the fact that you may have read an article six months ago means that you cannot be fair because things change so drastically in this uh, environment we live in, Your Honor. Sadly, since this event, there's been two other mass casualty events just since November of 2021. People's lives move on. People move on to the next news story. The suggestion that the easy solution here is to just pick another jury from another county completely ignores the fact that the jurors in La Crosse or Eau Claire or Marathon County may all come back with the same answers, right? Because today's uh, publicity is 24-7 uh, at the drop of an eye you can know what's going on. You could be sitting in Germany and reading about this case. So it's not exclusive to Waukesha County. Um, to Attorney Perry's point about, well, it's so pervasive here, people put out blue lights and they hung up Waukesha strong signs. Where's the prejudice to Mr. Brooks in that? Do the signs say Daryl Brooks is guilty? Do the signs say Daryl Brooks must be convicted of these crimes? The signs say Waukesha strong. That's it. Subject to interpretation by the viewer as to what that means to them. The purchase of concrete barriers by the city of Waukesha. Read the article they attach to their exhibit or to their uh, supplement. It doesn't mention Daryl Brooks by name. It doesn't talk about the case at all. It refers to the parade tragedy. Under no circumstances could anybody ever look at this and say this wasn't a tragedy. Six people lost their lives. That's a fact. That you don't have to talk about Daryl Brooks. You don't have to talk about his history. You don't have to talk about this case to say six people lost their lives that day and that's a tragedy. They quote, Chief Thompson in their supplemental uh, brief on page six. Chief Thompson is quoted as saying, quote, we want the public to feel safe coming to the city of Waukesha events, but we can never prevent every type of criminal activity. We are doing our best to make sure the events are as safe as possible, end quote. There's no mention of Daryl Brooks by name. There's no mention of this prosecution. There's no mention of anything. It's not prejudicial. It's not inflammatory. It's the chief of police saying to his community, come out, we want you to feel safe. You can't equate that with our community cannot be fair to Mr. Brooks. Mr. Brooks selected the location 
to commit these alleged crimes. He selected the fact that there would be thousands of people present to witness his alleged crimes. He selected the fact that of those thousands of people, probably dozens, if not hundreds, were recording his alleged crimes. There hasn't been anything unfair or prejudicial to Mr. Brooks overall in the community's response. The fact that the community has chosen to support the victims of this tragedy. Again, we're not seeing signs that say Daryl Brooks did this or Daryl Brooks did that. We're seeing recognition of the loss of life and the impact that it's had on the community for the other surviving victims. We think the Boston Marathon case is the most persuasive because it's the most factually similar and recent in time. A lot of these cases are very old and they can't account for today's uh, media outlets and uh, new sources that exist today. They just can't. But the fact of the matter is, whether he says it's nine counties or one county, one the third largest county in Wisconsin for that matter, the fact of the matter is that community support was present in Boston and it's present here. So in the court, the court in the Boston bomber case was very convinced that the judge was able to handle the voir dire process to the point where it could be fair and that the questions could be asked and that a uh, panel of reasonable jurors could be presented. In our analysis, Judge, we came up with over 500 potential jurors by filtering. We went through about 1,100. We didn't get through all 1,500. But 500 when we need 16? And that's taking out the ones that are blatantly, there. and there were some. There were some people that were very blatantly, this is not going to be the juror for this case, and we would agree to that. But even if we followed the filtering process of the defense, and it's a little unclear to me if this was a funnel or not, it almost reads like it was a funnel, like they started with 1,500 and then they eliminated uh, 720 people so that they, because they knew or someone who either attended or knew somebody who attended the parade. Um, then. From there, they went to 837 and said, well, 15 went to a prayer vigil, so we're automatically disqualifying them. They got down to 822 and they said 188 of them either donated <coughs> to a fundraiser, attended a fundraiser, or were members of a social media group in support of the parade victims, or had some display of solidarity. Those are four vastly different things, right? If I gave $5,000 to a fundraiser, I think that's very different than putting a blue light bulb at my house. But they clumped it together and said, we're going to automatically exclude those 188 people. And then they got down at the bottom of page eight. I think from there, they narrowed it down to 634 people. They automatically disqualified 192 of them for reporting that they were personally adversely affected by this incident, but again, who wasn't, who couldn't be personally adversely affected by this incident, whether you're sitting in Germany or in Waukesha County and you hear what happened, who would not feel some trauma, some response to that as a human being? But they automatically excluded those people then on page nine, they're down to 442 people. They said an additional 27 were personally familiar with someone injured or affected by the parade. So I assume they removed them, although to me that overlaps with the very first question, do you know somebody who was at the parade? It's got to be a similar uh, pool of people they're referring to there. They get down to 440. 15 potential jurors, 28 have viewed the court proceedings in this case. Doesn't automatically exclude them in my opinion, but to them it did. They get down to 387, they subtract another 13 who said they have kids in the Waukesha School District. 
And then at the very end of the, the second to last paragraph on the bottom of page nine, at the end of their brief, they say, uh, of those remaining few hundred jurors, 125 of them reported following the news on this case moderately to closely. So I'm assuming, going back to the uh, 387 minus 125 that they're identifying there, we still have well over 200 people, even under every filter that they've used, 200 potential jurors with no objective or subjective bias that could be brought to this courtroom in question to get to 16. Definitely enough people, Judge, after we've already filtered to this extent. They comment about 226 indicated they could not set, serve as a juror for that length of time. I guarantee you no matter where we go, we're going to get a high number on that question. Nobody is going to easily be able to set aside a month of their life to devote to this trial. We understand that. That number probably would go higher if we had to bring people from another county to Waukesha and sequester them. So that's not any reflection on, on this community. That's not saying I won't serve as a juror for a month because I think Daryl Brooks is guilty. That's just reality. And, and uh, people having a lot going on in their lives in today's world. Sending this or selecting a jury from another county is not going to cure that by any stretch. So we stand by our uh, process, Your Honor. We think there's several hundred people using subjective and objective bias me measures that could be brought in as a potential pool to serve on this jury right here in Waukesha County. Um, I think it's remarkable, Your Honor, that uh, even, uh, again, in the defense brief, they say on page five, uh, top of page five, the list of those victimized in the community is reported to be more than 560 individuals. That sounds like a lot until you remember Waukesha County has 400,000 people. So 560 were victims out of 400,000. We believe, Your Honor, that these jury questionnaires serve the purpose. They have identified for us the fact that in this community, there are people that can be fair, can be uh, asked to come and serve on a jury, even one of this length, that will be a hardship for them we understand it, but they would they will do it. Um, and we believe that uh, the passage of time has definitely worked uh, against the defense motion in this case, because sadly, as I remarked, just the last six months, there's been other uh, significant tragic events that have uh, uh, caught the attention of the world in the United States of America. So, um, for all these reasons, Your Honor, we do rely on our argument in the brief. Um, we disagree with the analysis that the defense uh, performed, and we're asking you to deny the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask uh, John Dunn one more time if anyone who's here, I don't have anyone um, on the Zoom. Okay. But if anyone would want to make a statement on the motion that's before the court today. Thank you. Judge, can I respond briefly? Very briefly. Okay. Yeah, just a few short points. Um, we don't have, there's, there's no criticism of this community coming together to show support and solidarity. It's just that if you have uh, with the victims in this case, you shouldn't then sit on a jury in this case to decide it. Um, it's many of the things that we talk about are admirable. Um, a funnel, uh, in terms of that question, yes, that's where those numbers were. Um, and again, not, as I tried to explain earlier, not applying a, oh, this conclusively shows 
uh, statutory or objective or statute, you know, or subjective bias, and therefore uh, there's no more questions that might be asked of this person if they got to voir dire. But in terms, you know, the the questionnaires which are in the court record uh, speak for themselves. Those those people that answered um, attend or know somebody who attended. Uh, the trends of that, in, in terms of how they answer those other questions, um, show significant familiarity with this case. Um, I don't see what showing there has been, aside from the Google Trends chart about the passage of time working against the defense motion. The coverage has continued. And as to the couple hundred left, uh, even after the defense analysis in this case, um, I go back to the language from the Wisconsin Supreme Court, which is a jury represents the community in which its members live. And even if you don't know somebody, didn't donate, didn't attend a fundraiser, um, what, what these questionnaires show is the pervasive effect and the profound effect that this has had on this entire community. And I think the further away you get from that, um, you might have, you'll have people that are aware of this, but those other factors that we've been discussing won't be present because they can't be. You wouldn't be surrounded by the constant reminders because those reminders are physical reminders of who are your neighbors, who's been personally affected, and all of the signs and other displays of solidarity. Thanks. Thank you. I did take a look at the population of Waukesha County. We did consult with um, a statistician at the Director of State Courts, and he is in charge of our jury pool and jury application, and uh, someone who I regularly consult with in my line of work as a judge on jury issues. Um, according to uh, what are official final estimates from January 1 of 2021, um, the final estimate for the population of Waukesha County is actually up to 410,666, with voting age estimates being at 316,329. And of course, that 18-year-old criteria is one which makes a juror qualified. There are other qualifications. Um, I did not, don't have at my fingertips the population for the city of Waukesha. Um, I'm gonna ask Monica, my clerk, to look that up and give that to me. Um, I know it's under $100,000, 100,000 people. At least my last driving past the sign. Uh, I think that's on West Paul Parkway. And I'll get back to that as I go on. So I want to start with um, what may not necessarily be brief, but a factual and procedural background to this case, because it is important as the court considers all of the issues today. Daryl Brooks is charged with 83 counts stemming from a series of events that are alleged to have occurred on November 21 of 2021 during and just prior to the Waukesha Christmas Parade in the city of Waukesha. The allegations are spelled out in the second amended criminal complaint, which is a 32-page document, the first 25 pages of which specify the charges, and the next seven pages of which detail the factual allegations. The very last page is simply a signature. The totality of the charges associated with the defendant's alleged conduct again, are specified starting on page, or in a 27-page information. Um, it's a little bit different than the second amended complaint, uh, and I'll get to that as I go through the procedural history. But I do want to summarize what the counts are. There are six counts of first-degree intentional homicide with an enhancer for the use of a dangerous weapon. This is a Class A felony, which carries a maximum life sentence plus five years for the enhancer if convicted. There are 61 counts of first degree reckless endangering safety with an enhancer for use of a dangerous weapon. This is a class F felony with a max term of imprisonment, 
total of 12 and a half years plus the five year enhancer. There are six counts of hit and run resulting in death, a class D felony. The max for that is 25 years. There are six counts of homicide by vehicle use of a controlled substance, also a class D felony, the maximum 25 years. There are two counts of felony bail jumping. Those are class H felonies, which carry a maximum of six years. And there are two counts of misdemeanor battery, domestic abuse related. Those are class A misdemeanors that carry a max of nine months. Now, the crux of the allegations against Mr. Brooks are that, are that on November 21 of 2021, he drove a red Ford Escape through the parade route, ignoring police orders to stop or redirect him, and in the process struck and killed six individuals and severely injured dozens more. The victims identified in the victim key have ties to eight of the 67 parade groups and were either participating in the parade or were spectators. The other counts or conduct in the complaint concern alleged conduct of Mr. Brooks with a former girlfriend. Those are the domestic abuse related charges that occurred just prior to him driving through the parade, as well as information about several open cases from another county for which Mr. Brooks was out on bail and formed the basis of the felony bail jumping charges. <laughs> for the purposes of the court's evaluation and assessment, Today, the court will accept as true the facts laid out in the defense motion to change venue as the state did not contest those facts in its brief unless otherwise noted below. Those facts are as follows. I apologize if I'm a little repetitive, but I do wanna be thorough here today. On Sunday, November 21 of 2021, the city of Waukesha held its annual Christmas parade. As stated in the original criminal complaint and as testified to at the preliminary hearing, there are approximately 100 entries in the parade with hundreds of participants and thousands of spectators. It is alleged that Daryl Brooks drove his car through the parade, intentionally killing six people and recklessly injuring and endangering the lives of 61 others. The victims of this tragedy are a diverse group and include members and relatives of the Dancing Grannies, an eight-year-old boy marching with the Waukesha Blazers youth baseball team, the Waukesha South High School Marching Band, the REMAX Services First Group, the Burris Logistics Group, the Waukesha Extreme Dance Team, and members of and a priest from the Catholic community of Waukesha and many spectators of the parade. Participants in the parade included 67 businesses and community organizations and included the Waukesha Police Department, the Waukesha Fire Department, the Mayor of Waukesha, the County Executive of Waukesha County, and both the Republican and Democratic parties of Waukesha County, Catholic Communities of Waukesha, Catholic Memorial High School, Carroll University, Christian Education Leadership Academy, and Grace Lutheran Church, along with the Waukesha Freeman. Following the parade, many people within the Waukesha community, uh, no doubt, rallied to provide support to the victims, including direct financial support, and to cope with what can I think genuinely be described as genuine trauma through prayer vigils and blue light broken heart displays. The Waukesha School District closed all schools on November 21 and 23. I would note though that the parade did take place the Sunday before the Thanksgiving holiday and prior to that parade students of the Waukesha School District were already scheduled to be off Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. It is also true that the district gathered trauma counselors who are made available to students, staff, and community members upon their return. The district, meaning the Waukesha School District, is made up of 28 uh, pre-K through 12 schools with 12,344 students and 829 teachers. One news outlet reported that more than 500 students received counseling on November 30, 2021, the first day back after the closure and Thanksgiving break. A local resident created the slogan, Waukesha Strong, and an accompanying broken heart drawing, which this court agrees quickly became synonymous with showing support for those impacted by the Christmas parade. The broken heart image and the words Waukesha Strong have been displayed across social media, in storefronts and business displays, on residential and business yards, and on pieces of clothing. 
Now, no quantifiable information was provided um, regarding the extent of these displays, but I would note the court, who myself is a member of the Greater Waukesha Community, has personally seen such displays primarily in the city of Waukesha when traveling through Waukesha for personal reasons. The court would not consider the displays pervasive or ubiquitous. As of February 10 of 2022, the hashtag, hashtag Waukesha Strong had over 245,000 views of TikTok and was posted over 7,000 times on Facebook and over 3,000 times on Instagram. I think we all could agree it's nearly impossible to determine whether any or all of these individuals are solely from Waukesha County. The United for Waukesha Community Fund was created to support the needs of families affected by the parade. This fund, established through the United Way and Waukesha County Community Foundation, raised over $3 million in donations as of December 3 of 2021 through 13,700 unique donations and reached 5,600,000 as of January 7 of 2022. The funds committee members include the Waukesha County Executive, the Mayor of Waukesha, the Director of Waukesha District Attorney's Victim Witness Assistance Program, and the Superintendent of the Waukesha School District. In addition to the millions raised by the fund, as of January 13 of 2022, approximately 41,000 people had donated to various GoFundMe fundraisers, which were created to assist victims of the Waukesha Parade incident. Blue light bulbs were distributed for community members as well to install and display outside their homes to show support for the Waukesha Parade victims. Waukesha natives Joe and Megan Schobert, Batteries Plus, Home Depot, TNT, and Ace Hardware sent 10,000 light bulbs to the city of Waukesha for distribution. Seven downtown business businesses distributed the bulbs free of charge. Additionally, every member of the Waukesha City Council was given a supply of blue light bulbs to distribute to their constituents. Prayer vigils were held at Humphrey Chapel, at Carroll University on November 22, and at Hills Corners Lutheran Church on November 23 of 2021. A vigil was also held at Cutler Park in downtown Waukesha on November 21, excuse me, 22 of 2021 and hosted by the Association of Waukesha Congregations with participation by the Brookfield Elm Grove Interfaith Network and the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. Speakers at the vigil included the mayor of the city of Waukesha, Sean Riley, the police chief, Dan Thompson, the fire chief, Steve Howard, and a representative from the Waukesha School District and many religious leaders. On November 22 of 2021, another prayer vigil was held at St. William Catholic Church. This was apparently also live streamed on Facebook. There is no doubt at each of the prayer vigils, large crowds attended, but it is unknown how many of the attenders were residents of Waukesha County. A number of benefits to support the victims were also held, including the following Waukesha County Sheriff's Department sold canine dogs, sorry, plush canine dogs, with 100% of the profits donated to the United for Waukesha Community Fund. Harley Davidson of Oconomowoc held a fundraiser on November 27. Avalon Graphics sold yard signs with the Waukesha Broken Heart logo with 100% of sales benefiting the Community Fund. Culver's of Waukesha donated 50% of sales on November 24 to victims and families. Coast Car Wash has donated all sales from its Waukesha, Pewaukee, and West Dallas locations on November 24 to families of victims. Bosco Social Club donated 50% of proceeds between November 26 and 28. The Coop donated all proceeds from November 26. The Waukesha Masonic Lodge hosted a pancake breakfast on December 4. The Saloon on Calhoun hosted a benefit on December 14 and Waukesha Skateland hosted a benefit on December 15. As of February 8 of 2022, the Waukesha Strong Community Facebook group had 5,600 members. This group's page included a list of upcoming events related to local fundraisers, all of which were presumably held on the dates and locations listed. Although I have all of them listed, they are listed in the defense brief, and I'm going to just incorporate that 
in by reference. Although I would note it's unclear how many of these events are directly related to the parade and which are for other reasons. Immediately following the incident, a temporary memorial sprung up in Veterans Park in downtown Waukesha. It was displayed for more than a month, and at the, at the end of December of 2021, it was disassembled and relocated to the Waukesha Historical Society. Since the filing of the defense's original change of, motion, change of venue motion and accompanying affidavit and exhibits, local media coverage has continued. The following are examples cited by the defense. On March 17 of 2022, the Milwaukee Journal posted on its website an investigatory article titled, How Police Prosecutors and Courts Across Three States Fail to Hold Daryl Brooks Accountable. The article is accompanied with a picture of an in custody and shackled Mr. Brooks being led into the courtroom by an officer. And I'm told the article remained visible on the front of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel's web site every day for two months after the article was posted. The court would describe this article as being an in-depth investigative piece that presented objective information to the reader. It uses words such as allegations and accused. And perhaps more telling is there is no dispute of the vast majority, if any, of the information reported in that article. I won't detail the other parts of the article, detailed by the defense, again, that is in their brief and incorporated herein by reference. Work has continued to create a permanent memorial for the victims of the parade incident. On March 19, it was reported that a memorial for the parade victims was installed at City Hall, featuring the paintings of the deceased victims. The article, which was posted on WTMJ.com, states, the six were killed when prosecutors say Daryl Brooks Jr. drove his SUV through the parade route. On May 27, 2022, the Milwaukee Journal reported that the Waukesha Parade Memorial Commission announced it was considering three sites to memorialize the six people killed. The list of those victimized in the community is reported to be more than 560 individuals. The United Way, excuse me, the United for Waukesha Community Fund disbursement allocations announced that the fund had raised 6.2 million plus to support the more than 560 parade victims. This was apparently published on March 15th in the Waukesha Freeman. The Freeman went on to report that allocation of funds was approved in the following categories, families of the six people killed, individuals who were physically injured, and individuals who were physically present at the parade, including first responders and other medical professionals treating the victims. On March 17 of 2022, a five foot by 20 sign was hung on the side of the Metro Transit parking structure stating, quote, resist black terror. And this was five feet by 20 feet. According to city administrator, Kevin Lehner, he noticed similar incidents since the parade. This incident at the Metro Transit parking structure was reported to the Freeman on March 19 and the patch on March 22. The article reported that, quote, the city has seen an uptick of racist messages since Daryl Brooks was arrested. Thankfully, the sign was quickly removed. The incident with the sign appeared to be very isolated, and it was condemned by city officials, including the mayor and a representative, representative of the Waukesha Police Department. The court has not been provided with any other details of other incidents but in any event, they appear to be the responsibility of fringe individuals whose values are not reflective of the city of Waukesha and the greater Waukesha community. Local news outlets have also reported on the purchase by the Waukesha Common Council of barriers known as MVB3X, spending $830,000 to do so. These barriers immobilize vehicles in the event of an impact 
and are estimated to withstand a force from a truck up to 16,500 pounds. As the state noted in its arguments uh, today, the article, but for um, one sentence from the mayor, which referenced Daryl Brooks, um, does not go through the events of the incident or otherwise mention Mr. Brooks. It is primarily regarding the purchase of the barriers and a separate article from the Freeman did not even mention Mr. Brooks. There was apparently an article on March 3rd, excuse me, on May 30th on Fox 6 News Milwaukee um, about the Waukesha Memorial Day Parade and the use of the traffic barriers and made reference to Daryl Brooks. However, they did use words such as allegations um, and then further commented about how three of the high school bands were marching together. It has also been reported that the Waukesha and that the city of Waukesha's 4th of July celebration will be themed a Waukesha Strong Parade. And the first 4,000 visitors of the neighborhood beer garden will receive free Waukesha Strong Glow bracelets. Now the only piece of evidence offered by the state is a graphic embedded in its brief from the Google Trends website, which the state claims shows that the populist focus of the incidents relating to the actions of Mr. Brooks have subsided over the passage of time. While relevant as to the search terms Waukesha, Daryl Brooks, and Christmas Parade, the state did not include the phrase Waukesha Strong. I do not know whether utilizing just Waukesha would also capture that. I suppose it depends on how it is spelled, uh, but I just wanted to note that omission. In anticipation of the charges being filed against Mr. Brooks and the increased media and public interest in this case, the court system in Waukesha took a number of steps to assist with public access to records associated with the case and the court proceedings, including providing access to the criminal complaint on its website and a link to the court's live stream information. I would note that the use of Zoom and live streaming became a common tool used by the courts during the COVID-19 pandemic, both for litigants and associated parties, including victims of crimes. Live streaming is an excellent way for the courts to provide public and media access to hearings with minimal disruption to those in the court room. The court also issued a general order addressing such topics as filming, seating, parking, courtroom attire and signage, all of which help to ensure the court hearing is safe, orderly, and dignified, to safeguard victim privacy, and to minimize the impact on other users of the courthouse and county buildings, among other things. In addition, prior to the initial appearance, two areas of parking adjacent to the courthouse were cordoned off for media, trucks, and reporters. Again, to minimize impact to the other users of the court courthouse and county buildings. The following is a listing of the significant or noteworthy events in this case, what I will refer to as the procedural history. On November 23 of 2021, a five count criminal complaint was filed against Mr. Brooks, charging five counts of intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon. At that hearing, bail was set at $5 million with various conditions. On November 29 of 2021, an amended complaint was filed adding a sixth count of intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon after it was learned a sixth victim passed away. On January 12 of 2022, a second amended complaint was filed. This is what I referenced earlier with six counts of intentional homicide use of a dangerous weapon, 61 counts of first degree reckless endangering safety, This was a 32 page document, the vast majority of which concerning the charges and the penalties associated with them. 
On January 14 of 2022, a contested preliminary hearing was held. Probable cause was found and the defendant was bound over. An arraignment date was set for February 11 of 2022. One day prior to that, on February 10 of 2022, a substitution of the assigned judge was requested and granted, and the change of motion, sorry, the change of venue motion was filed. The court notes it was a timely motion under the statute. At arraignment on February 11 of 2022, a 27-page 83-count information was filed along with 12 citations. Six additional counts were added, the homicide by vehicle use of a controlled substance, I believe the hit and run homicide charges had previously been filed with the second amended complaint, but in any event, all of the citations related to the traffic related homicide charges were filed on February 11. On March 11th of 2022, this court held its first hearing on this case. At that hearing, of 2022, both the state and the defense filed their proposed jury questionnaires. On March 29 of 2022, the court held a hearing on those questionnaires. The questions were finalized. I know the parties will, I'm sure, remember the court took a lengthy adjournment so that the parties could confer and present a joint submission to the court. All but a few questions were included in the questionnaire. It was also on that date that the defense raised the potential for an adjournment. The court required a written motion and set deadline and motion hearing dates in the following week. On April 1 of 2022, the motion to adjourn was filed. And on April 4 of 2022, the motion was heard by this court and denied. Also on that date, the court set this date to address the change of venue motion and other deadlines for submissions and the trial order deadlines were finalized as well. I neglected to say at the April 11th date, I'm sorry, at the March 11th date, the court also set aside one month on its calendar for trial and requested the same of all parties. On April 7th, this court filed a written order regarding the jury questionnaires. On April 11th, the trial scheduling order was filed. During that time, of course, the court had the clerk's office initially send out 2,500 qualification questionnaires. I will get into the breakdown a little bit later in the discussion of the issues, but ultimately, due to a variety of reasons, um, approximately 1,600 um, of the carefully crafted case-specific questionnaire was sent to potential jurors. All of that was turned over to the parties starting on, I believe, May 23rd, and then the court gave them until June 10th to file their written submissions, which of course both parties did. And then of course the motion hearing was scheduled for today, which as everyone knows has started. I've referred to the filing as a motion to change venue. I would agree with Attorney Perry. It covers more than a request for change of venue, and I do cover that in my decision here today. The motion that was filed on February 10 of 2022 claims that a fair and impartial jury cannot be impaneled in Waukesha County under Wisconsin Statute Section 971.22 in relevant case law. 
in the alternative and pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 971.225, the defense seeks an order that a jury panel be drawn from another county where a fair and impartial jury may be found. In addition, and irrespective of whether the change of venue motion is granted or a jury from another county is used, the defense seeks an order requiring the jurors be sequestered during the trial pursuant to Wisconsin Statute Section 971.12. Now, the Wisconsin Constitution provides that criminal trials shall be held in the county or district wherein the offenses were committed. Specifically, Article 1, Section 7 of the Wisconsin Constitution provides as follows. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to be heard by himself and counsel to demand the nature and cause of the accusation against him, to meet the witnesses face to face, to have compulsory process to compel the attendance of witnesses in, in his behalf, and in prosecution by indictment or information, to a speedy public trial by an impartial jury of the county or district wherein the offense shall have been committed which county or district shall have been previously ascertained by law. Wisconsin State Statute Section 971.19 sub 1 provides that venue shall be in the county where the crime was committed, except as otherwise provided in the statute. The following parts of the statute uh, do not apply in this case. However, the due process clause of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution requires fundamental fairness in the prosecution of state crimes and entitles a state criminal defendant to an impartial jury as well. And of course, these constitutional rights trump statutory change of venue in appropriate circumstances. The uh, citation for that is Morgan versus Illinois, 504 U.S. 719, a 1992 case, and Oswald versus Bertrand, 374 F. 3rd, 475, a Seventh Circuit case from 2004. Change of venue is grounded in constitutional principles of due process and the right to a fair and impartial jury. As stated, both the United States and Wisconsin constitutions require that an, that an accused be tried before an impartial jury. That is the United States Constitution Amendments 6 and 14, and again, Wisconsin Constitution Article 1, Section 7. This also was discussed in McKissick versus State, 49 Wisconsin 2nd, 537, a 1971 case, a case that has really become the seminal case in Wisconsin concerning pretrial publicity and a fair and impartial trial. Due process requires that the accused receive a trial by an impartial jury free from outside influences where there is a reasonable likelihood that outside influence may prevent a fair trial. That's from Shepard versus Maxwell, 384 U.S. 333 a case out of the United States Supreme Court from 1966, one of the seminal cases on this topic as well. However, outside influences of pervasive and adverse pretrial publicity do not inevitably lead to an unfair trial. That is from Skilling versus United States, 561 U.S. 358 from 2010. Under Wisconsin law, a defendant may move the court for a change of the place of trial on the ground that an impartial trial cannot be had in the community, excuse me, in the county. That is a citation to 971.22. In order for a change of venue to be granted, the defendant must present sufficient evidence to show that there is a reasonable likelihood of community prejudice so pervasive as to preclude the possibility of a fair trial in that community. That's a citation to McKissick, 49 Wisconsin 2nd at 545, and also State versus Albrecht, 184 Wisconsin 2nd, 287, from the Court of Appeals, 1994. A motion for change of venue is addressed to the sound discretion of the trial court, Holland versus State, 87 Wis 2nd, 567, a 1979 Wisconsin Supreme Court case. 
That discretion is guided by constitutional requirements that the accused is entitled to a fair trial. Thomas versus State, 53 with second 483 from 1972. Where there is a reasonable likelihood that prejudicial news will prevent a fair trial, trial courts must transfer the case or take strong measures to ensure the accused receives a trial by an impartial jury free from outside influences. That is from Shepard at 363. In considering whether to grant a motion for a change of venue, the Wisconsin Supreme Court has stated the following factors to the extent that they are relevant must be considered. I state that because some of the factors can only be evaluated at the conclusion of a trial. Factors five and eight, along with part of three, are typically reviewed on appeal after the trial has concluded. But these factors are as follows. One, the inflammatory nature of the publicity. Two, the timing and specificity of the publicity. Three, the degree of care exercised and the amount of difficulty encountered in selecting the jury. Four, the extent to which the jurors were familiar with the publicity. Five, the defendant's utilization of preemptory and for cause challenges. Six, the state's participation in the adverse publicity. Seven, the severity of the offense charged and eight, the nature of the verdict returned. The mere fact that jurors may have been exposed to pretrial publicity does not in and of itself establish the prejudice required to change the trial venue. Turner versus State, 76 Wisconsin 2nd 1 at page 27. An informed jury is not necessarily a prejudicial one. Turner at 27 and 28. The constitutional guarantee of a fair trial before an impartial jury is not, however, synonymous with a change of venue. Briggs versus State, 76 Wisconsin 2nd, 313 from 1977. Change of venue is only one method of guaranteeing a fair trial. Others are voir dire and continuance. Again, a citation to Briggs. Objectionable news reports are those that attempt to influence public opinion against a defendant, Briggs versus State. Objective information and non-editorial reporting is not objectionable. Hoppy versus State, 74 Wisconsin 2nd 107 from 1976. Even reflective non-inflammatory editorials are not objectionable. Turner versus State. 76 Wisconsin 2nd 1. In addition, the prejudicial effect of publicity wanes with the passage, passage of time. That is from Tucker versus State. 56 Wisconsin 2nd 278 from 1973. The issue of when pretrial publicity impacts the ability of an accused to receive a fair trial is not new. Not to this county, not to this state, and not to courts across the United States. Courts have tackled the issue of pretrial publicity in a variety of settings. The question this court must answer is the same as the question the United States Supreme Court was tasked in answering in Skilling versus United States, which is, when does the publicity attending conduct charged as criminal dim prospects that the trier can judge a case as due process requires, impartially, unswayed by outside influence. As both the United States Supreme Court and the Wisconsin Supreme Courts have considered this question, sorry, as stated, both the United States Supreme Court and the Wisconsin Supreme Court have considered this question in diverse settings. I am going to take some time to go through a number of these cases today. A look at Shepard versus Maxwell and other SCOTUS cases, including Skilling versus United States, are essential to understand the context in which convictions have been set aside on the basis that the accused did not receive a fair trial. Such cases are the bedrock of the legal principles enunciated in Wisconsin case law on these issues. Of course, the court will also review the seminal Wisconsin case of McKissick versus State and others. In Shepard versus Maxwell, 
Shepard's wife was bludgeoned to death in the upstairs bedroom of their home. From the outset, officials focused suspicion on Shepard. He was accused of murdering his wife and ultimately tried and convicted by a jury in a particular county in Ohio. I don't want to state it wrong, so that's why I didn't state it. Both before and during the trial, Shepard was the subject of extensive newspaper, radio, and television publicity, including many unfavorable matters which were never presented to the jury. The judge denied various requests by Shepard's counsel for a continuous change of venue, mistrial, and questioning of the jurors as to their exposure to the publicity. During the nine weeks of trial, reporters were seated at a press table inside the bar and within a few feet of the jury box. The corridors, the rooms throughout the courthouse, and most of the seats in the courtroom were filled by members of the press. Members of the media handled and photographed exhibits lying on counsel table. Broadcasts were conducted from a room adjacent to the jury room. Courtroom proceedings, which were supposed to be private, were overheard and reported by the press. And the noise of the members of the press going in and out of the courtroom made it difficult for counsel and witnesses to be heard. During the trial, many witnesses were interviewed by the press prior to their testimony, resulting in the disclosure of their testimony. Testimony of witnesses who had testified was available in the press to witnesses who had not yet testified. In addition, before the trial, the names and addresses of the jurors were published and they received letters and phone calls concerning the case. Then, during deliberations, the jurors were also allowed to make phone calls. The trial judge in that case made no effort to control the release of leads, information, and gossip to the press by the prosecuting attorneys, the coroner, police officers, or witnesses. Shockingly, Shepard was convicted. The Supreme Court overturned that conviction, holding that the failure of the trial judge to protect the defendant sufficiently from massive, pervasive, and prejudicial publicity and disruptive influences attending the prosecution deprived the defendant of a fair trial in violation of the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. SCOTUS, SCOTUS itself, which that is, of course, an acronym for the Supreme Court of the United States of America, itself has commented on Shepard in later cases, including in Skilling versus United States, wherein it noted that the months of virulent pretrial publicity about the defendant involved more than heated pretrial reporting. The murder conviction was reversed because of a, quote, carnival atmosphere that pervaded the trial. Riddle versus Louisiana, another Supreme Court case, found at 373 U.S. 723 from 1963, is another example of where the proceedings themselves were so devoid of fundamental fairness that a conviction was overturned. In that case, the defendant, Wilbert Rideau, robbed a small town bank, kidnapped three bank employees, and killed one of them. The local sheriff interrogated the defendant in jail without counsel present and obtained a detailed confession, which was done without the defendant's knowledge and recorded and televised three times to large local audiences shortly before the trial. The recording was described by the court as a moving picture film with a soundtrack of the quote, interview quote, in the jail between Riddo and the sheriff of the local parish. The interview was 20 minutes in length and shown three times on three consecutive days in the parish. A parish with an approximate population size of 150,000. The estimated audience size for the showing was 24,000, 53,000, and 29,000 respectively. In addition, the trial court denied Riddle's motion for change of venue. During voir dire, the trial court also denied four requests by Rideau to strike jurors for cause after he had exercised all of his peremptory strikes. Two jurors who had seen the coverage and two jurors who were deputy sheriffs of that very parish. 
Riddle was convicted and sentenced to death. The Supreme Court again overturned a criminal conviction, finding that the media coverage manifestly tainted the criminal prosecution. Without even pausing to examine the voir dire, the court held that the, quote, kangaroo coat proceedings, quote, trailing the televised confession violated due process. In Estes versus United States, the Supreme Court set aside a conviction despite the absence of any showing, any showing of prejudice, stating the following. It is true that in most cases involving claims of due process deprivations, we required a showing of identifiable prejudice to the accused. Nevertheless, at times, a procedure employed by the state involves such a probability that prejudice will result that it is deemed inherently lacking in due process. That's found at 381 U.S. 352, again a case from the Supreme Court from 1965. In Estes, the defendant was indicted by a Texas County grand jury for swindling. Massive pretrial publicity resulted in national notoriety. Following a change of venue and on the day of trial, a hearing was held on defendant's motion to prevent broadcasting and news photography and for a continuance of the trial. The hearing was conducted in the presence of some trial witness and veneer members who were later released. It was carried live on television and radio and news photography was permitted. The original jury panel, the defendant, the attorneys and the trial judge were, were highly publicized during the two days the hearing lasted. A different trial was impaneled in this case. Four of the jurors on the later panel who were selected for service had seen or heard all or part of the broadcast. At that prior hearing um, where that motion was being considered, at least 12 camera men were engaged in the courtroom, taking motion and still pictures and broadcasting the proceedings. Cables and wires were snaked across the courtroom floor. Three microphones were on the judge's bench and others were beamed at the jury box and the counsel table. On appeal, it was conceded that the activities of the television crews and news photographer, photographers led to considerable disruption of the proceedings. The motion to prohibit broadcasting and photography that was held at that hearing was denied. The motion for continuance was granted. At the trial about one month later, the scene in the courtroom had thankfully been altered. Although the press was permitted in the courtroom, they were restricted to a particular area of the courtroom and only opening statements and closing arguments of the state and the return of the verdict were televised live. Defense counsel requested and the trial court agreed to prohibit coverage of any kind live or still during the defense summations to the jury. During that trial, excerpts from the earlier motion hearing were rebroadcast in the local market. Estes was convicted. The United States Supreme Court overturned this conviction because the defendant was denied due process of law. The court ruled that an actual showing of prejudice was not required because the trial court did not satisfy even the appearance of justice, reasoning that the videotapes of the hearings clearly illustrated that the trial was not one of judicial serenity and calm to which the defendant was entitled. So in Rideau, Estes, and Shepard, the United States Supreme Court overturned convictions obtained in a trial atmosphere that was corrupted by press coverage. However, the court in Skilling noted that their decisions cannot be made to stand for the proposition that juror exposure to news accounts of the crime alone presumptively deprives the defendant of due process. The court in Skilling went on to state, prominence does not necessarily produce prejudice and juror impartiality, we have reiterated, does not require ignorance.
skilling at 381. Citing another Supreme Court case, Irvin versus Dowd, 366 U.S. 717 from 1961, wherein the court stated, jurors are not required to be totally ignorant of the facts and issues involved. Scarcely any of those best qualified to serve as jurors will not have formed some impression or opinion as to the merits of the case. Skilling also quoted Reynolds versus United States, 98 U.S., 145, an 1879 case, where the court very poignantly stated, every case of public interest is almost as a matter of necessity brought to the attention of all the intelligent people in the vicinity, and scarcely anyone can be found among those best fitted for jurors who has not read or heard of it, and who has not and who has not some impression nor some opinion in respects to the merit. The court in Skilling ultimately reaffirmed that a presumption of prejudice attends only in the extreme case. In United States, or excuse me, in Skilling versus United States, a long time Enron Officer Jeffrey Skilling was indicted on 28 counts, including allegations of conspiracy, fraud, misrepresentation, and insider trading related to the collapse of the Enron Corporation. Skilling was Enron's chief executive officer from February until August of 2021 when he resigned. Less than four months later, Enron collapsed into bankruptcy and its stock plummeted in value. After an investigation uncovered an elaborate conspiracy to prop up Enron stock prices by overstating the company's financial well-being, the government prosecuted dozens of Enron employees who participated in the scheme. In time, the government worked its way up the chain of command and indicted Skilling and two other top Enron officers, executives. The indictments against these three executives alleged that Skilling and the other two engaged in a scheme to deceive investors about Enron's true financial performance by manipulating its publicly reported financial results and making false and misleading statements. It's important to note that at one point, Enron was the seventh highest revenue grossing company in America, and Houston, Texas was the home of its corporate headquarters where Enron was a large employer in the area. That is, of course, the location where the trial took place and where Skilling was indicted. Following his indictment, Skilling moved to transfer the trial to another venue based on what he contended was hostility toward him in Houston, coupled with extensive pretrial publicity, resulting in the poisoning of potential jurors. In support of his motion, Skilling submitted hundreds of news reports dealing Enron's downfall, as well as affidavits from the experts he engaged portraying community attitudes in Houston in comparison to other potential venues. The trial court denied the motion to change venue, concluding that the pretrial publicity did not warrant a presumption that Skilling would be unable to obtain a fair trial in Houston. The trial court noted that despite incidents of intemperate commentary, media coverage on the whole had been objective and unemotional, and the facts of the case neither heinous nor sensational. Moreover, the trial court asserted that effective wadir would deter juror bias. In the months leading up to trial, the trial court asked the parties for questions it might use to screen potential jurors ultimately accept, accepting Skilling's more probing and specific submission with slight modifications into a 77 page, sorry, 77 question, 14 page comprehensive jury questionnaire that it then mailed to 400 prospective jurors. The trial court received responses from nearly all the addressees. Of those who responded, the trial court granted hardship exemptions to about 90 individuals and the parties with the court's approval further reduced the pool by excusing 119 for cause, hardship, or physical disability. 
The parties agreed to exclude in particular each and every prospective juror who said that a pre-existing opinion about Enron or the defendants would prevent that juror being impartial. Skilling renewed his change of venue motion, arguing that the jury questionnaires revealed pervasive bias and that news accounts of co-conspirators' guilty plea further tainted the jury pool. The trial court again declined to move the trial, ruling that the questionnaires and voir dire provided adequate safeguards to ensure an impartial jury. The court did adjourn the proceedings a couple of weeks. Ultimately, the court qualified 38 prospective jurors, a number sufficient allowing for preemptory challenges to impanel 12 jurors and four alternates. Following trial, Skilling was convicted of 19 of the 28 counts and acquitted of nine insider training counts. Skilling appealed, claiming, among other things, that the pretrial publicity and community prejudice prevented him from obtaining a fair trial. The United States Supreme Court affirmed the convictions and on the due process claim held that pretrial publicity and community prejudice did not prevent Skilling from attaining a fair trial. Skilling did not establish that a presumption of juror prejudice arose or that actual bias infected the jury that tried him. In affirming the convictions, the Supreme Court also stated Jurors need not enter the jury box with empty heads in order to determine the facts impartially. It is sufficient if the jurors can lay aside their impressions or opinions and render a verdict based on the evidence presented in court. The Supreme Court found that Skilling's trial shared little in common with prior cases where a presumption of juror prejudice was found, noting that pretrial publicity, even pervasive adverse publicity does not inevitably lead to an unfair trial. In sum, the court in Skilling looked at relevant precedent on the issue of pretrial publicity and the following factors in affirming the trial court. One, the size and characteristic of the community in which the crime occurred. Two, although news stories of skilling were not kind, they contained no blatantly prejudicial information. Three, the length of time following the reported crime and trial, as well as the diminishing decibel level of media attention in the four year, years following the collapse of Enron and the trial. Four, the acquittal of the defendant on nine of the 28 charges against him. And five, the carefully crafted, executed, and effective jury selection process, including an expanded jury pool and the 77 question, 14 page questionnaire, unlimited use of strikes for cause, additional preemptory strikes, group voir dire, individual voir dire, attorney led follow up during voir dire and clear instructions to the impaneled jury based on the law and the evidence, sorry, and clear instructions to the impaneled jury to follow the law and the evidence received at trial. Significant to the issues presently before this court is the affirmation that through the use of carefully planned and executed voir dire and the careful identification, inspection, an extensive screening of prospective jurors through voir dire, outside influences of even pervasive and adverse pretrial publicity do not inevitably lead to an unfair trial. Another case worth discussing is United States versus Sarnev, which I may refer to as the Boston Marathon bombing case if only because it's easier to say. That is found at 142 Supreme Court 1024, actually released just, I believe, this April of 2022. Let me get the date because I think it may have come out after the defense motion was filed. It 
was released March 4 of 2022. So it is clearly the most recent case out of the United Supreme of, of the United States Supreme Court dealing with the issue of pretrial publicity. In this case, the court discusses the right to an impartial jury. A little bit of background is helpful in understanding the decision of the court. On April 15 of 2013, brothers Dehozar and Tamerlan Sarnev planted and detonated two homemade bombs near the finish line of the Boston Marathon, killing three and wounding hundreds. Three days later, as investigators began to close in, the brothers fled and in the process murdered a campus police officer at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, carjacked a graduate student, and fought a street battle with police who were located, who had located them in the stolen vehicle. Dakozhar attempted to flee in the vehicle and in the process inadvertently ran over and killed his brother. Dakozhar eventually abandoned the vehicle and hid in a covered boat being stored in a nearby backyard where he was arrested the following day. Many of us in this room can probably remember watching that video. Dakozar Sarnev was indicted for 30 crimes, including 17 capital offenses. Sarnev did not seek a change of venue, perhaps because it was in federal district court and they do pull from a number of counties. Be that as it may, in preparation for jury selection, the parties jointly proposed a 100-question form to screen prospective jurors. The trial court adopted almost all of them, including many that probed for bias. Several questions also probed whether media coverage might have biased a potential juror. One such question asked if the prospective juror had formed an opinion about the case because of what he had seen or read in the news media. Others asked about the source, amount, and timing of the person's media consumption. Another asked whether the prospective juror had commented or posted online about the bombings. The trial court rejected a defense request to ask jurors to list the facts he or she had learned about the case from the media and other sources because such a question was broad and unfocused and would cause trouble by producing unmanageable data. Sarnov objected to the removal and the trial court, court further explained the question was too unguided. In recognition of the intense public interest in that case, the trial court summoned an expanded jury pool calling 1,373 prospective jurors for the first round of jury selection. After reviewing the answers to the questions, the court reduced the pool to 256. During jury selection, Sarnev renewed his request to question each juror about the content of the media he had consumed. The court again denied his request and instead permitted counsel to ask appropriate follow-up questions about media consumption based on answers in the questionnaire or at voir dire. Over the course of the three weeks of in-person voir dire, the court and the parties reduced the 256 prospective jurors to 12 seated jurors. The jury convicted him of all 30 counts and recommended the death penalty for six of them. At the conclusion of the sentencing phase, the jury concluded Sarnov warranted the death penalty for six of the 17 death penalty eligible crimes. The trial court sentenced him to death. Sarnov appealed. The Court of Appeals vacated the capital sentences on two grounds. One related to the trial court's refusal to ask every prospective juror what he learned about the case from the media. The other ground concerned the exclusion of evidence sought by Sarnov at the sentencing phase of the trial which will not be further discussed as it was, does not relate to the issue of pretrial publicity and the right to an impartial jury. The government appealed to the United States Supreme Court, which ultimately reversed the Court of Appeals and reinstated the capital sentences. 
In examining the Sixth Amendment issue, the United States Supreme Court reiterated the long-standing guarantee that an accused has the right to a trial by an impartial jury, noting that the right to an impartial jury does not require innocence. That's Sarnov 142 Supreme Court at 1034, citing Skilling versus United States. The court also stated that notorious crimes are almost as a matter of necessity brought to the attention of those informed citizens who are best fitted for jury duty. Of course, a citation to the Reynolds versus United States case this court has already referenced. At trial, sorry, a trial court protects the defendant's Sixth Amendment right by ensuring that jurors have no bias or prejudice that would prevent them from returning a verdict according to the law and evidence. The court in Sarnov, like in many of the cases SCOTUS has considered, repeated the mantra that, quote, jury selection falls particularly within the providence of the trial judge. Because a trial judge's appraisal is ordinarily influenced by a host of factors impossible to capture fully in the record, such as the prospective juror's inflection, sincerity, demeanor, candor, body language, and apprehension of duty. A trial court's broad discretion in this area includes deciding what questions to ask prospective jurors, including wide discretion in the area of pretrial publicity. This discretion does not vanish when a case garners public attention. Indeed, in such circumstances, primary reliance on the judgment of the trial court makes especially good sense. After all, quote, the judge sits in the locale where the publicity is said to have had its effect and may base her evaluation on her own perception of the depth and extent of new stories that might influence jurors. There is no blanket constitutional requirement that the trial court ask each project prospective juror what she heard, read, or saw about a case. Instead, it is the responsibility of the trial court to conduct a thorough jury selection process that allows the judge to evaluate whether each potential juror is to be believed when that juror says she has not formed an opinion about the case. In Sarnoff, the question the defense insisted on asking was wrongly focused on what the juror knew rather than on potential bias. As such, the Supreme Court found that the trial court did not abuse its discretion in refusing to include the question in the questionnaire or asking it in voir dire. Perhaps most relevant to the issues before this court is the Supreme Court's affirmation of the jury selection process used in that case, which it found dispelled any doubt concerning the jury's impartiality. The Supreme Court in Sarnev noted the following. The questionnaires asked prospective jurors what media sources they followed, how much they consumed, whether they had ever commented on the bombings in letters, calls, or online posts, and most pointedly, whether any of that information had caused the prospective juror to form an opinion about Sarnev's guilt or punishment. The court then subjected those 256 prospective jurors to three weeks of individualized voir dire in what the court and both parties had the opportunity to ask additional questions and probe for bias. The district court also provided emphatic and clear instructions on the sworn duty of each juror to decide the issues only on evidence presented in open court. The court reminded the prospective jurors that they, quote, must be able to decide the issues on the case based on the information or evidence that is presented in the course of a trial and not on information from any other sources, quote, an instruction that was repeated during the trial. In sum, the court's jury selection process was wholly consistent with this court's precedence. Again, citing directly from the Sarnev decision. In McKissick versus State, the Wisconsin Supreme Court identified eight factors 
for a court to consider when assessing a motion to change venue and related requests. Those factors have been cited with approval multiple times in subsequent cases, including in State v. Font, the most recent case in which the Wisconsin Supreme Court assessed the denial of a change of venue motion. Now, in McKissick, the defendant had filed a motion for a change of venue on the basis of an article by the Milwaukee Journal, which indicated that McKissick was awaiting trial on a charge of firebombing during the Milwaukee County riots, a charge that was separate and apart from the case then set before the trial court. The article went on to further mention that the defendant's brother had been killed by police during the same firebombing incident. On the day of trial, an extensive wide deer of individual jurors was conducted by the court, wherein eight jurors admitted knowledge of these incidents and expressed the possibility of prejudice. All were struck by the court. One juror admitted reading the incidents, but expressed ability to decide the case on the evidence actually presented. Defendant's counsel in that case did not move to strike the juror for cause, nor did he use a peremptory strike on her. The request to change venue was denied. McKissick was, a, was convicted and he appealed. The Wisconsin Supreme Court stated a change of venue may be a constitutional right in those cases where adverse community prejudice will make a fair trial impossible, noting that a determination is addressed to the sound discretion of the trial court. The court elaborated that this discretion is, is circumscribed and must rest upon consideration of the evidentiary matter presented. If the evidence gives rise to a reasonable likelihood that a fair trial cannot be had, it is an abuse of discretion to deny a motion for change of venue and that any doubt in the mind of the trial court be resolved in favor of the defendant. However, a change of venue is only one method of guaranteeing a fair trial. As stated previously, others include voir dire and continuance. The court in uh, McKissick reasoned that it is the trial court's responsibility to make inquiries of the jurors as to whether there is prejudice and to take such steps as may be necessary to ensure a fair trial. And then that court reiterated the eight McKissick factors already put on the record. The court in Font further went on to state that in affirming the denial of the change of venue, the court reasoned that not all improper news stories published, even during trial, will warrant a reversal and a new trial. The court reasoned that jurors need not be entirely unaware of events in their community to constitute the quote impartial jury quote that is constitutionally required. The Wisconsin Supreme Court similarly upheld the denial of a motion to change venue in Hebbard versus State. In Hebbard, the defense requested a change of venue where jurors had prior opinions and knowledge, but affirmatively stated they could remain partial throughout, through, through setting them aside. The defendant claimed error in that case, which stemmed from an incident in Brown County. Upon review, the Wisconsin Supreme Court again relied on the McKissick factors to assess whether the trial court abused its discretion. Many of the factors already cited to by this court were relied upon in that court in affirming the conviction and the denial in that case of the motion to change venue. In doing so, the court held that the use of voir dire examination to eliminate jurors with this knowledge was 
proper as jurors are not excused for cause by being newspaper readers or even for having formed an opinion from such reading. It is only when they are unable to lay aside an opinion derive, deriving from press publicity and render a verdict on the evidence presented. In Tucker versus State, 56 Wisconsin 2nd 728 from 1972, the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that juror knowledge of an accused is not enough to rebut the presumption of a prospective juror's impartiality and create a reasonable likelihood of prejudice to warrant the granting of a request to change venue. In that case, Tucker sought a change of venue because of extensive coverage by the media. Once again, the Wisconsin Supreme Court used the relevant McKissick factors to determine whether, under that case in Shepard versus Maxwell, there is a reasonable likelihood that pretrial news prior to trial will prevent a fair trial. The court began by assessing the nature of the publicity and noted that there is no denial that the media coverage of community tensions, disorders, and criminal activities, the actions of killing a police officer and wounding of several others was principal, but that the media ultimately shifted its focus to from the actions of the defendant to the officer's survival from the brink of death. Now, in this case, the nature of the publicity the court held was not prejudicial as the issue was now why he was shot, not whether he was shot, that became the issue at trial. The court continued that even if publicity in a particular form may preclude a fair trial, under Shepard, the mandate is to transfer the case or to continue until the threat abates, which clearly recognizes that the effect of newspaper and certainly radio and television coverage of events wanes with the passage of time. Perhaps the important point for this court to take from that case in assessing the issues before the court, including in that case, was that the trial was 11 months after the alleged offenses and references in, in the news media to the incidents had steadily decreased in length and frequency with little to no reference in the six or seven months prior to, to trial. The court went on to reason, though, that the passage of time is only one factor to be considered on the right to change venue. Further, the record established evidence of care being exercised by the trial court in the selection of the jurors, even though jurors or some among them could remember reading or hearing about the case. The court held that this knowledge of what is written or said is, quote, not enough to rebut the presumption of a prospective juror's impartiality and to have obtained information of the matters through newspaper, radio, or television is not cause for challenge to a prospective juror in this state as it is not required that jurors be totally ignorant of the facts and issues involved. As set forth already, a motion for change of venue is addressed to the sound discretion of the trial court. That discretion is guided by constitutional requirements that the accused is entitled to a fair trial, including an impartial jury, where there is a reasonable likelihood that prejudicial news will prevent a fair trial, the trial courts must transfer the case or take strong measures to ensure the accused receives a trial by an impartial jury free from outside influences. The constitutional guarantee of a fair trial before an impartial jury is not synonymous with a change of venue. A change of venue is only one method of guaranteeing a fair trial. 
The court may look to other methods, including an expanded and carefully crafted jury selection process. To put it another way, even if or even in the face of pervasive and adverse publicity, a change of venue is not required where the court takes strong measures to protect a defendant's right to an impartial jury free from outside influences. In evaluating the motion to change venue now before the court, it is imperative that this court discuss the McKissick factors. One, the inflammatory nature of publicity. There can be no doubt that the Waukesha Christmas Parade incident and the case against Mr. Brooks have received widespread public and media interest. The state conceded that the actions of Mr. Brooks received a high degree of publicity initially following his arrest and caused the surrounding Waukesha County community to rally in support of the victims. These events included prayer vigils, fundraisers, support groups, and other community relation events, many of which were covered by local media. The articles cited are generally objective and focus on the factual circumstances of the events, whether those events are regarding Mr. Brooks himself, the response by the community and city officials, victims, or court proceedings. While not specifically addressed in the briefs, the court is aware of publicity across a variety of platforms, print, broadcast, internet, and social media. Many articles and news stories have been printed and aired. Coverage of the incident and related community impact has included the following. Footage of the parade. Both what I will describe as the footage near the beginning of the parade route near White Rock and Maine of the Ford Escape driving past parade participants and spectators just prior to any participants or spectators being hurt or killed. Two, the band footage, which depending on which version is shown, and probably all of it, is graphic video showing the Red Ford Escape driving at band members. Most outlets stopping the video short of the vehicle striking anyone due to its graphic nature. The court also considered the photos and footage of Mr. Brooks himself, including the booking photo, which this court agrees is an unflattering picture of Mr. Brooks. Two, the photos and images and footage of Mr. Brooks wearing the green smock. Again, in custody and unflattering, but not unique to Mr. Brooks. While not every day, it is not uncommon to see an individual produced from the jail in this attire. Third, his in-court appearances while wearing the standard orange jail attire and mask with a bailiff escort. Four, the ring doorbell footage of the arrest. Court also considered that photos of the victims have been publicized. Photos of the victims, especially those of the six killed and their names, have been widely reported during the initial days and weeks following the incident. There were also uh, photos, images, and footage of the vigil, or vigil, vigils, plural, um, and the makeshift memorial. No doubt, news reports, both video and print, um, on various topics initially permeated this area. Other reporting included of the incident, community response, recovery of victims, funeral services for victims, Mr. Brooks' other legal matters, and history of contacts in the justice system and criticism of the justice system and the alleged failures of it and bail reform. Social media has popped up. There was reference to the community um, Facebook page and other social media applications. The courtroom proceedings have been live streamed. Photos, recordings have been played on news media as well. 
November 21 of 2021 will no doubt be a day many people in Waukesha County do not soon forget. It is not every day a vehicle drives through a parade. However, in general, the nature of the publicity has been factual and objective. Even the news articles, whether online or in print, that criticized Mr. Brooks being out on bail and the calls for bail reform were objective and factual. Overall, they were and continue to be factual in nature and not in an attempt to influence public opinion about the guilt or innocence of Mr. Brooks or even of what punishment he should receive if convicted. Nothing about the articles and other evidence submitted by the defense leads this court to find the publicity has been inflammatory. While it has been prolific at times and even adverse to Mr. Brooks, given the nature of the charges, the information and reports about the incident have been straightforward and consistent with information publicly available in the criminal complaint. They all generally appear, again, to be factual and do not create a presumption of prejudice or in an attempt to influence public opinion. Nonetheless, the parties will be able to question jurors during the jury selection process about whether any exposure to publicity has resulted in the prospective juror forming any opinions related to this case that would impact the juror's ability to be fair and impartial. Number two, timing and specificity of the publicity. As noted by the state, this factor is similar to the first factor, but focuses more on the pervasive nature of the publicity and the timing of it relative to the trial date. Even with the added information about publicity in the defense supplement, it is clear to this court the most intense media coverage occurred immediately following and in the first few weeks following the parade. It is also true that media interest increases around court dates related to the case. That is not unique to this case and is true for any case that grabs public attention. The best available evidence is the Google Trends graph submitted by the state. Despite the limitation noted by the court, the search words and phrases analyzed are broad and cast a wide net in an attempt to gauge state and local interest in the case, and yet focused enough to provide valuable information to this court. This graph shows that while there is a steady interest in, quote, Waukesha, the confluence of all three peaked in the immediate aftermath of the incident. Moreover, the court has no reason to doubt the oft quoted axiom that the passage of time diminishes the prejudicial impact of pretrial publicity and allows for memories and passions of readers and viewers to fade. And I have no doubt that will be the case here noting that the trial in this case is scheduled to start almost 10 months after the incident occurred. Moreover, any concerns over juror prejudice and pretrial publicity can be further explored through the jury selection process. Three, the amount of difficulty and degree of care employed in jury selection. The court recognizes the increased media and public interest in this case and that the amount of pretrial publicity to date and the impact to the victims and the community at large, the criticisms levied against the criminal justice system in general, and the nature and gravity of the charges filed against Mr. Brooks. This is why the court has started to take and will continue to take strong measures to ensure Mr. Brooks is tried by a fair and impartial jury. This plan includes the following. Expanded jury pool. As the parties are aware, this court initially sent 2,500 qualification questionnaires to prospective jurors, advising them of jury service for this case. Of those, approximately 16, 
1,500 were qualified for this case. 64 of the qualification questionnaires were undeliverable. 11 went to deceased members of our community. 235 were disqualified by statute. 74 were excused for medical reasons. 185 were excused permanently due to age and medical reasons. And 254 were postponed, a normal process that is afforded to jurors when they get a jury summons. That left approximately 1,560 qualification, case-specific qualification questionnaires to be sent. Now, the numbers I have from the clerk's office are an approximate. Um, originally, they sent out 642 case-specific qualification questionnaires but the timing of receiving the return qualification questionnaire or perhaps request for deferment or postponement or excusal um, affected those numbers. For this expanded jury pool, the court then carefully drafted a comprehensive case-specific jury questionnaire, a questionnaire that was primarily drafted by the parties and approved by the court. This 115 question, 30 plus page document was generated with significant input by the parties and ultimately approved by the court. All but a small number of proposed questions were included in the questionnaire. Prospective jurors are asked about things including their familiarity with the allegations against Mr. Brooks, the parties, witnesses, victims, both individuals and organizations impacted by the incident, pretrial publicity, and whether they have formed opinions about Mr. Brooks' guilt or innocence, among other topics. Two days are set aside in late August to discuss the questionnaire what I have termed a questionnaire conference, at which time the parties will be able to strike jurors for cause, either by agreement of the parties or with approval of the court. The number of strikes for cause is unlimited. In addition, once that process is completed and at the start of trial, the court will take as much time as necessary to impanel a jury. This will be done initially by group voir dire led by the court with an opportunity given to the parties to submit proposed questions. The court will also engage in individual voir dire led by the court with follow-up by the attorneys as needed, including in the areas of what I would call red flag answers incomplete answers, and on the topic of content of media exposure, timing, and nature. Again, all tailored to whether the prospective juror has formed an opinion as a result. That is just a sampling and, of course, not the entire entirety of the questions that will be asked. I will reiterate, both parties will be given a sufficient opportunity to submit questions to be asked during this time, and the court will allow for not only individual follow-up, but attorney-led follow-up as well. I've already talked about the unlimited strikes for cause. This is true not only for the jury instruction or the jury questionnaire conference, but during the voir dire itself when we are face to face with the prospective jurors. The court 
is also going to give the parties additional preemptory strikes. In a case such as this, the parties would normally have seven preemptory strikes, six because the charges include an intentional homicide charge and one for the alternates. I am going to, in my discretion and pursuant to my inherent authority, give a total of four additional strikes for a total of 10. So six plus one for each alternate impaneled, the goal of which is to seat 16 jurors, of which 12 to ultimately decide the case. The media order, this court, the general order that has been referenced previously will continue. That includes an aspect of juror privacy. And as outlined below, a modified sequestration requirement. While it is true that this factor cannot be fully evaluated until after the jury selection process has concluded with 16 jurors, it also provides the defense with the opportunity to re-raise the issue of venue should justice so require. It is worth noting through a number of high, pro high profile cases of equal or greater magnitude have all utilized such a process with success and in accordance with constitutional requirements. One such case from Waukesha County is what I have referred to as the Slender Man case. In that case, the change of venue motion was denied. There was a case specific questionnaire and the court impaneled for alternates among other things. The court has already discussed Skilling and Sarnev. Another case of note, although from another district court, so federal district court, is the Mitchell case. Now, while most people may not recognize that name, they undoubtedly will recognize the name of Elizabeth Smart. That case was the federal kidnapping case related to her. And it is that case that I referenced at a prior hearing about the use of jury questionnaires. The court, in looking at the size and characteristic of Waukesha County, would also note the following. Waukesha County is the third largest county in the state of Wisconsin, only being eclipsed by Milwaukee and Dane. According to the official final estimates, from the 2020, I believe, census in comparison to the 2010 census, the final estimate for the population of Milwaukee is almost 950,000, Dane 551,000, slightly over, Waukesha 410,000, and then it drops significantly. Brown County is the next county with 267,000, Racine is next with 197,000, Outagamey following with 189,000. Dane is the most similar in size and had a 2020 master jury list of almost 381,000, roughly 70,000 more than Waukesha's master list of 311,000 plus. The master list for 2022 in Waukesha County is actually 300, closer to 314,000. So any other county outside of Milwaukee and Dane would no doubt pose a significant or would be significantly smaller and provide a significantly smaller jury pool than that available in Waukesha County. 
the court would not consider Milwaukee an acceptable alternative, primarily because they have a significant backlog in their criminal courts, have significant staffing challenges, both as it relates to court reporters and court staff, and a limitation of space. Of course, the court could consider a jury from there, but as I will get to momentarily, the court does not consider that necessary. Dane, I do not believe, is similarly situated to Waukesha County and appropriate for this court to consider in the change of venue request and the paneling of a jury outside of the county. Turning back to the McKissick factors, number four, juror familiarity with publicity. As has been stated almost ad nauseum during my decision here today, a juror need not be unfamiliar with the facts of a case or even the parties involved. Jurors need not be excused based solely on the fact that they follow local media or are engaged or are an engaged member of the community. They need not be ignorant or a blank slate. What is important and constitutionally required is that the jurors be impartial. This factor is focused on whether the prospective jurors can set aside their prior knowledge of a case and return a verdict based on the facts and information presented at trial. The state concedes that a significant amount of the jury pool will have been exposed to some coverage of the allegations against Mr. Brooks. The state also correctly points out that exposure to the incident does not necessarily require a juror to be excused. Knowledge of a case by potential jurors does not inherently warrant a change of venue, but instead can be explored and subsequently remedied through a vigorous voir dire process. The court would also note that the city of Waukesha is not the county of Waukesha. And, and it is the city of Waukesha that has been primarily impacted by this incident. And I think that is borne out through the review of the jury questionnaires that have been provided. This court also takes issue with the defense characterization of the potential jury pool based on the information provided in the jury questionnaires. The court's own evaluation yields a prospective jury pool warranting further evaluation of nearly 70% of the almost 1,600 questionnaires reviewed. The court reached this conclusion by categorizing the jurors into five different categories, those being clearly admissible, likely admissible, neutral, likely inadmissible, and clearly inadmissible. By looking at categories four and five, likely inadmissible and clearly inadmissible, the court reduced the prospective jurors by 287 for likely inadmissible and 166 for clearly inadmissible. As I indicated, other individuals fell with a neutral, likely admissible or clearly admissible. Of course, those jurors warrant further examination. That is the process of jury selection. And of course, these numbers could even change following the jury questionnaire conference that is scheduled to be held in August. The defense wrongly assumes that blank or incomplete responses means a jury or a juror is biased or prejudiced. Such a position is not supported by law. 
The law affords all jurors with the presumption of impartiality. A missing or incomplete response might be indicative of bias or prejudice depending on the answer or even other answers provided in the questionnaire, but such an analysis is missing here. At a minimum, the court and the parties are entitled to follow up with those prospective jurors during in-person voir dire, all of which could lead to a rehabilitated juror depending on their responses. The defense fails to take into account this process that is scheduled to start in August and for which the court has set aside two entire days. Again, at which point there will be an unlimited availability of strikes for cause. Of course, those must either be agreed to or approved by the court. And then again, at ultimately the trial in this case, a further in-person opportunity to strike jurors for cause. However, in this case, the winnowing of the prospective jurors at this time must be the result of an adversarial hearing and not based on conjecture or speculation. The court just wants to note that at the time that I analyzed all of these questionnaires, not all questionnaires were received. Overwhelmingly, the vast majority of them had. My numbers are of 1,554 jurors who that, res that have responded. And again, while some have trickled in since that time, the number is too small to be statistically significant. And even if they all contained negative attitudes toward Mr. Brooks, they would not change the analysis of this court. However, even if this court were to strike the prospective jurors at this stage that are highlighted by the defense, that would leave 148 jurors subject to in-person voir dire. I don't agree with that number because, as the state pointed out, there is a funneling of jurors and perhaps some duplication but most importantly, too many assumptions attendant with the responses or lack of response by many of the jurors on select questions. I also looked at um, two of their criteria that struck 27 or 28 jurors who had knowledge of the court proceedings and 27 or 28 that um, had twenty seven who were personally familiar with someone injured or affected by the parade, and twenty eight who had viewed the court proceedings in this case. As again, I've stated repeatedly here today, knowledge is not enough to strike a juror for cause. So even if I add those back in, the number is roughly 203-0204, a number that is significant, that is certainly a number large enough when taking into account strikes for cause and the number of peremptory strikes the court is granting the parties. Your Honor, I do, I do want to correct something factually. Sure, go ahead. Um, we didn't exclude people if they were, if it was left blank, they were included. And so when I wrote that uh, a left blank answer, you know, just a failure to answer uh, we assumed the answer was no. That was because, like, for instance, if a question was, do you know somebody at the parade or did you attend the parade, if that was left blank, 
then we did not include them in that tally so i think the opposite of what what you just said thank you and then additionally because this has been talked about and i tried to clarify this in in the supplement in terms of the counting but that tally would not include any duplicates and so the numbers for those individual ones are much greater in terms of the overall people that would have reported those things but it was for instance if you had answered yes to that first filter that we suggested um the the subsequent counts would only be those that had answered no to that first filter if that makes sense and then on and on and on so we didn't have any duplicates understood thank you as to that the court would know so with that funneling and the lack of duplication the case law makes clear that knowledge familiarity um, do not alone cause a juror to be biased or prejudiced I would add to the size of the juror pool, even with all of the strikes, if I assumed everything the defense is saying is true and sound legally and factually, leaving the court with 148 jurors. I checked with the clerk's office on the recommendation from the director of state courts on the number of jurors we would typically call for an intentional homicide case. I was told the clerk's office would summon, summon 50 in hopes that 40 showed. So when in relation to that recommendation, which by the way is not pulled out of thin air, it is based on years and years of data on the number of jurors actually questioned during voir dire in the state of Wisconsin, and I believe in consultation with the National Center for State Courts. Um, 148 versus 40, clearly, clearly a number sufficient to impanel a fair and impartial jury here in Waukesha County. Turning next to number five. Defendant's utilization of peremptory and four cause strikes. Again, this is another criteria that cannot be fully assessed ahead of time. However, as has already been noted, the parties will have unlimited strikes for cause both at the jury questionnaire conference and during in-person voir dire, as well as 10 peremptory strikes each. Seven each pursuant to state statute, plus three additional per the inherent authority of the court based on the number of alternates and the nature of the case, including the pretrial publicity. Number six, the state's participation in adverse publicity. Of course, the defense has not argued that the state of Wisconsin through the district attorney's office has participated in adverse publicity. I would note the state has taken extra steps to ensure minimal information is released to the general public. For example, during this case and what is normal practice in this county, search warrants are sealed for a period of time. When the search warrants in this case were set to be unsealed, so prior to that time the state filed a renewed motion to seal, which this court granted, thus keeping a lot of that or all of that information uh, confidential. Of course, all of that information goes to the defense. They are in no way prejudiced. All of that has been provided to, to them, and that, in fact, was the order of this court. Other information is sealed both by statute and by the Constitution, namely victim information. Um, this court, not just in this case, but in every case, the state files a motion to steal, seal the victim identification key. Now, in this case, the state has taken an extra step 
by asking that all of the filings pursuant to the court's scheduling order be sealed. The court signed that as well to in fact limit information to the public and thus the potential jury pool. The comprehensive jury questionnaire is sealed and will remain sealed during this case. I've also considered going forward that sealing or maintaining a seal on juror information at least while the trial is in session and likely through an appeal. The court also has participated in providing information to the public. No doubt, even today, the court is live streaming these proceedings. I would note that live streaming provides the court with a mechanism to assist with court security, victim privacy, victim and family access, and it minimizes the litigant and jury exposure to the media by a court order. In other words, the court limits who and what is allowed in this courtroom. The court is fortunate to have a beautiful new building for which there is a media room, a conference room, adjacent to this courtroom. Thus, cameras don't even set foot in this courtroom. They are behind glass. I've allowed one still photographer as per the court order. But all of this helps in isolating and protecting the jury as well. I've talked, of course, at length about the jury selection process. And even though this court has live streamed, um, I do not believe that in any way creates a prejudice to Mr. Brooks. A standard question in this court's voir dire script is to ask jurors what they have seen or heard about court proceedings or read or if they have read any court related documents. My standard question is really a general one related to their familiarity with what I call CCAP and the Wisconsin Circuit Court Access and includes a question specific to whether anyone has researched the case. I will of course continue with that during the group led or the court led group voir dire and follow up as needed. Number seven, the severity of the offenses charged. Mr. Brooks is charged with 83 total offenses, 18 of which are homicide related charges and faces significant exposure. The loss of life and the intentional homicide charges are no doubt one, if not the most serious of crimes charged in the state of Wisconsin. I also want to acknowledge the unusual circumstances of this case and the crimes being accused here involving Mr. Brooks's conduct at the city of Waukesha Christmas Parade. No doubt these charges are serious. No doubt the immediate impact to the city of Waukesha significant. There are 61, let me back up. There are six named victims for the intentional homicide charges and 61 other named victims related to the reckless endangering safety charges. There's also the victim of the domestic abuse charges. But these facts alone are not dispositive on the change of venue request. Regardless of whether the trial is held here, 
some other place or a jury impaneled from elsewhere, the same charges will be tried. On balance and in light of the other considerations, the court is nonetheless able to ensure that Mr. Brooks received a fair and impartial, a, excuse me, a fair trial with an impartial jury here in Waukesha County. The last criteria, nature of the verdict returned, of course, is not relevant at this stage of the proceedings as we are pretrial. In conclusion, the court, of course, started by asking the following question. When does the publicity attending conduct charged as criminal dim prospects that the trier can judge a case as due process requires impartially, unswayed by outside influence. Given the facts presented in this case, the relevant statutes, constitutional provisions, and case law, it is clear to this court that a change of venue is not required. This court is committed to ensuring that the rights of Mr. Brooks to a fair trial and an impartial jury are protected. In this case, the defense has failed to demonstrate that there is a likelihood of community prejudice so pervasive as to preclude the possibility of a fair trial in Waukesha County. The defense has also not demonstrated actual bias or actual prejudice in this county. There is no doubt in the court's mind that an impartial jury can and will be impaneled in Waukesha County with the strong methods outlined today. For all of these reasons, the motion to change venue is hereby denied. For the same reasons, the motion to impanel a jury from another county is also denied. Now this court has considered the request to sequester. Sequestration in and of itself can be a hardship on jurors, being away from their family as well as work and other obligations. The jury trial in this case is currently scheduled for one month to ensure adequate time has been set aside for in-person voir dire, the trial, and deliberations. Some prospective jurors, although willing to serve, expressed concern over sequestration and the hardship it would cause to be away from family and other responsibilities. The court is not unmindful of the challenges of sequestration for jurors. However, in order to ensure Mr. Brooks is tried by an impartial jury, this court will grant in part the defense request for sequestration and allow for modified sequestration as outlined as follows. Once a jury of 16 is impaneled, juries will be sequestered at the courthouse during each day of trial, but allowed to return home at the end of the day, what this court will refer to as the Kenosha way. This was a prophylactic used during the highly publicized trial of Kyle Rittenhouse last year, and one which this court viewed as being appropriate and meeting the needs to ensure a fair and impartial jury. These jurors will meet each day at a different undisclosed location for transport to the courthouse by the clerk's office and law enforcement. This will ensure that jurors are kept separate from victims, witnesses, attorneys, and the media. The clerk's office will be responsible for transport of the jurors to and from the meeting locations. The jurors will use a secure entrance when coming to and from the courthouse and will be escorted by the jury bailiffs and law enforcement. This will not be an entrance accessible to the public. Jurors will be referred to by numbers assigned to them by the clerk's office. Please note, this is not an anonymous jury. The parties will have full access to their biographical information as they would in any trial. But in lieu of sequestration, this is an important step in ensuring 
the jurors remain impartial. Juror information will be sealed while the case is pending and through appeal or as otherwise provided for by statute, whichever provides greater privacy. Any request for juror information will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and decided pursuant to the sound discretion of the court. Lunch for the jurors will be provided daily by the clerk's office. Jurors will have limited access to their personal electronic devices during the day, except during the longer recesses and lunch. Jury instruction 51 will be read at various and multiple points during the trial, including at the start of Wadir, a summary of the instruction at any breaks and at the end of each day. The general order will remain in full force and effect during these proceedings. All of this takes into account that the jurors who are impaneled for this case are afforded the presumption of impartiality. These jurors also take an oath, not once, but twice during their service in this case. This modified sequestration order also in the court's mind eliminates the possibility of jurors resenting the court or the parties, including Mr. Brooks, for not being with family during their time of service. Of service. I'd also note that more jurors were willing to serve with no sequestration order. I'm just going to take a moment to look back over my notes, make sure I have not overlooked anything. <coughs> Did you get that population? One piece of information I'd like to add to the record today is the population for the city of Waukesha. According to the census information on www.census.gov, um, the July 1, 2021 estimate for Waukesha County is 408,756 and the city of Waukesha 71,000. 256. That number is significant because as I have stated, the primary impact of this incident is within the city of Waukesha, not the county of Waukesha. Undoubtedly, there will be people within the county, not a citizen of Waukesha, that are impacted by this incident. That is what the case questionnaire seeks to uncover, and of course, what in-person voir dire will also address. That then concludes uh, the hearing today. Are there any additional requests at this time from either of the parties from the state? Uh, nothing further, Your Honor, thank you. From the defense. Yes, the, uh, the court had given us until, I believe, July 1st or June 30th to enter any special pleas, and it is Mr. Brooks's intention to change his plea to not guilty by reason of mental disease or defect. Are you requesting an evaluation under the statute? We are. Are you requesting any specific entity or doctor perform that evaluation? 
we would request Dr. Westendorf. I do have her contact information. In light of that request here today, does the state have a request? Well, we actually have Dr. Collins on retainer for this case, Your Honor, in the event there was a special plea entered. So I don't know if Dr. Westendorf is able to uh, serve, but she, if, uh, if that's the defense request, that inquiry, certainly we have no objection as long as there's no conflict for her. And then, yes, we are requesting an evaluation by Dr. Collins. Do you want uh, a couple of days to look at whether there's a conflict since I believe they both work for behavioral consultants? Yeah, I didn't know that they had Dr. Collins on retainer. And so if we could, um, I don't know what your preference would be if it should just be like a proposal in writing for the doctor to be appointed. Sure, given the request here today and pursuant to uh, state law, the court will appoint um, a doctor to evaluate Mr. Brooks in relation to a special plea. The state has already indicated it has Dr. Collins on retainer, so I'll appoint her for that purpose. Um, I'll withhold naming a specific doctor for the defense until you can verify Dr. Westendorf is able to do that. If so, I will gladly appoint her. If not, simply provide another name to the court and I will um, appoint that person. At this time, I'll reserve whether a third doctor under the statute is an appropriate exercise of discretion by the court. Anything else then uh, from the defense? No. All right, then that concludes the hearing. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. News 3 Now is always on. Get the Channel 3000 app, activate the push alerts, and we will send you breaking news, traffic, and weather alerts as it happens. The Channel 3000 app. Get it now. Powered by News 3 Now. News